There you have a quorum. Great. Um, Turn, and you'll be called out according to the last three digits of your phone number. So, um, all right. Uh, let's move on to approval of minutes. Do we have a, a motion to approve the July 14th, 2020 regular session minutes? So moved. I'll, uh, okay. it's, been, it's been moved and set. It's moved by Councilmember Martin, seconded by Councilmember Peck. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. All right, the motion passes unanimously. All right, um, it looks like, um, uh, do we have any agenda revisions? Anybody want to? Councilmember Christensen. Oh. oh, sorry. I see, the revised, I see that there's a revised ordinance for item 10A regarding the dismount zones. Very good, uh, thank yeah, you. I, I see that, but right now, just is there are there agenda revisions or submission, or motions to direct city manager and and staff to bring back future agenda items. That's really what I'm asking for. Um, a while back, um, I requested a um, uh, the police department to report on their use of force. That was mainly to educate the, um, the public on uh, whether we should defund or divert police funding by 10% to housing and human services. I know that um, uh, the city manager and uh, the police department is working on that um, use of force statement. I would like to amend it to include um, whether they, whether our police department ever uses medical injections such as was used on Elijah McCain. Um, Mayor Councilor Beck, Beck, yep. Thank you. Um, I, I agree with uh, Councilwoman Christensen, but um, I would like to have this in this report not not only do the police use in any type of injections to calm a an arrestee or do do the emt uh people use any injections are there any other questions okay all right that said let's move on to city manager's report an update on COVID 19. carol uh, Mayor Council, um, so one thing that I want to touch on is not technically not COVID related, but it is this year. So I did want to report to you all um, that based on our mosquito trapping, um, we are going to be spraying um, on Thursday evening. We are following our policy and notifying those folks that are requesting the shutoffs. Again, you can see it decreasing. This is really echoing what the governor talked about today in his press conference. And, and when you see the chart associated with Boulder County, you, you're gonna see a significant difference in terms of the age range of, of people that are um, testing positive. Again, um, higher in the 20 to 29 year old population. And statewide, you can see this general decline. Um, this, this diagram is the one that the governor was referencing today on his um, um, on his press conference. And, and what you really see is what's happening in, in other communities. When we were at the, the peak in April for us, you could see a 25% positive rate. That's really what they're seeing in some of the um, locations in the, in the states that are considered the hotspots. Today in, in Colorado, um, 4.56. Um, so we've really been hovering around this 5% recently, even with the the increased number of positive cases in Colorado. Again, you can see the high points in Boulder County. Um, and, and you can see, again, as we watch trends, you're seeing the graphs move in a very similar fashion. The difference in this is I am going to, again, call attention to the y-axis on this one. When you see many places talking about generating hundreds of cases, um, you know, our high point in Boulder has still been 45. Um, but you can see the movement in the graph that mimics what we're seeing at the state level. Um, the last few days have been pretty good. We're still um, probably a few days to a week out of seeing what the impact is of the new masking order and um, the closures of uh, establishments after 10 p.m. Um, but hopefully the data will continue trending in this direction. Um, this is the graph that I wanted to show you when 
when you looked at the state graph in terms of where um, the positive tests are being generated, um, you know, the state had more of this gradual incline like this. What we're really seeing um, in Boulder County it is again in this 20 to 29 year old population. And that's where you're seeing a lot of the, um, the work being done in terms of communicating um, with, with the um, public information that they're putting out especially as the university is getting ready to go in session. The county has um, worked to, they are creating a um, situation where they work or a program where they work with individuals from the community. And I know they're really focused on um, trying to get some college age students on that group so they can, um, you know, increase the communication in this age range. But when you look at the actual number of cases, uh, Boulder is now at 707, we're at 626. Um, again, that is really directly, you can really start seeing those age demographics starting to play in the community numbers and the number of people testing positive. Uh, and then this is the demographics in terms of uh, white, non-Hispanic, Hispanic, Latin, X in the different communities. Um, if you'll remember last week, I talked to you all, I think it was 36 I can't remember if it was with council or with the city wide WebEx. At one point it was 36.8, another point 36.2, now 35.9%. So you're actually seeing this number start to drop, which then is starting to correspond with where you're seeing the age demographics in terms of um, who, who is testing positive. This is where we stand in terms of hospital services in Boulder County. Again, um, I put the caveat that, that we are still doing elective procedures and other um, normal hospital work, so, so that will adjust this. But in terms of ICU beds available, uh, non-critical vents and critical vents, we're still in really good shape in terms of the hospital system. So again, really important for us to um, you know, manage three things, wear our masks, socially distance, and wash our hands. Uh, I may have mentioned it to this group, there was a really interesting medical study out that said if we do those three things, um, it has the potential to be almost as impactful as a vaccine. One moment. Uh, Mayor, we have eight guests that I've let in. All right, perfect. I'm sorry. Let's go ahead and start. Um, I'm here tonight to address some serious concerns with the prairie dog extermination permitting process. Um, I'm calling tonight to speak about the bike dismount ordinance as it's currently written. Um, I do think that there's some merit in the overall idea. However, I vehemently disagree with the fine structure that will ultimately either go unenforced or disproportionately affect our lower income residents. All I want to tackle the, the fracking issue, which is coming up a little bit later. Um, it, and it just make a couple of comments of, on which I'm extremely concerned. First, I want to request that Dr. Helming's contract be renewed when it comes up for renewal last next month. I use that data almost every day. I have asthma, COPD, so knowing the air quality is vital to understand whether I dare spend extensive time outdoors. All right, it's been moved by Councilmember Christensen that we pass the consent agenda except for F. And I'll second that. I lip read. All right, um, seeing no discussion, let's go ahead and vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. All right, the consent agenda minus F has passed. Um, let's move on to ordinances on second reading, specifically 10A ordinance. Uh, so uh, we would encourage the public to call in now. Um, and so uh, we've only got one. Uh, well, since the first reading of the ordinance, city staff and the LDDA worked with Bicycle Longmore on a couple of changes to the ordinance mm -hmm. in order to make it a little more bicycle friendly. Specifically, there are two changes that are being requested. And the first is the change is to actually change the dismount zone. So instead of the dismount zone being from first to long to keep, it would be different depending upon which side of the main street you're on. Uh, for the west side of main street, the dismount zone would be from third to long to keep. 
and on the east side of Main Street, it would be from 2nd to Long's Peak. And this change was requested because there's no alternate route between 1st and 2nd on the east side of Main. And on the west side of Main Street, uh, the bicyclists would like to be able to ride between 2nd and 3rd to access the regional bus stop just south of 3rd Avenue. I move but, approval of um, Ordinance 2020-28 as presented in, in the agenda tonight. All right, I'll second that. All right, seeing no further discussion, let's go ahead and vote. All in favor of uh, approving Ordinance 2020-28 on second reading, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. All right, let's go on to the Regional Air Quality Monitoring presentation and oil and gas update, please. Shall I take it away? Good evening, Mayor Bagley and members of City Council. My name's Jane Turner, and I'm the City's Oil and Gas and Air Quality Coordinator. I'm new, this is a new position. I just started in April, and I'm really excited to have the opportunity to present to Council. I've spoken with a few of you over email, but um, it's nice to be able to have this opportunity to introduce myself to you as well as to Longmont residents. I'm a certified professional engineer and I have a PhD in air quality engineering from CU Boulder and I'm really grateful to have this opportunity to work with a city that's being so proactive about environmental monitoring and showing such an interest in air quality research. So you can bring up the slides now. And I think I've introduced myself so we can go to slide two. I'm gonna be providing a brief update on some oil and gas activities, and that'll be followed by a presentation on the city's regional air quality monitoring by Dr. Detlev Helmig of Boulder air Atmospheric Innovation Research. The first update is regarding production activities at the Stamp Well. The Stamp Well is an oil and gas well that's located on the northwest side of Union Reservoir. And some residents have expressed concerns about some of the production activities that have occurred, particularly between July 2019 and March 2020. During that time period, a workover rig was observed at the site. And the residents have expressed some concerns about whether any of these activities have been in violation of the city's agreement with Cub Creek Energy. Staffs have reviewed the activities that occurred during this time frame. We've reached out to our contacts at the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, the COGCC, because they regulate the activities at this site. And we've also spoken with our special oil and gas legal counsel, Phil Barber. Based on these reviews, it's the current understanding and belief of the city staff that the activities were in accordance with state regulations and that none of these activities have specifically violated the city's agreement with Cub Creek. The next update is also on the stamp well and it's regarding ongoing remediation activities there. This remediation is a separate topic and not related to the production activities I was discussing on the last slide. The remediation is happening because there was a spill, a leak of some fluids at the site and that was identified on May 14th of this year. Workers at the site found that the source of the leak was a crack in a fiberglass tank this was a large holding tank, 100 barrels. It was stored above ground and it was holding produced water. So that's water that has come back up out of the well. There is right now no ongoing leak at the site. The tank that was cracked has been removed. There's no threat to residents that we're aware of. And regarding the Cub Creek Agreement, the accidental spill at the site is also not in violation of that agreement. The last update I have for you is not about the stamp well, it's about the night wells. And these are oil and gas wells which are planned to be drilled in 2020 outside the city properties to the north. The night well pad is located directly north of Union Reservoir but south of Highway 66. Now the night wells are still in the planning stages but what is happening is that we have received construction plans for an access road that will allow the operators to get to that well pad. Those plans are currently being reviewed by city staff in the development and review group. And it's our understanding that Cub Creek intends to begin construction of that road as soon as those plans are approved in order to keep them on uh, their planned timeline of beginning drilling the night wells in September of this year. 
So now for the main event, we'll be hearing a presentation by Dr. Helmig on the city's air quality monitoring study. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for having me here on the call. Okay, so um, um, Dr. Turner already nicely summarized this. There's several objectives um, covered by this program. The first one is um, to monitor greenhouse gases um, released from the footprint of the city with a goal to assess the city's path towards um, sustainability. Um, the second point was to monitor primary oil and gas emissions, and then to provide these data and interpretations to the public and as well um, to the research community, industry partners, um, and so forth. And we are monitoring quite an array of different atmospheric um, variables. Uh, most of these are, are atmospheric gases, and I've listed them here again. So these include carbon dioxide, methane, a whole series of volatile organic compounds, so abbreviated as VOCs, um, and we'll see several of those further down. Then we're monitoring nitrogen oxides, we're monitoring ozone, also particulate matter or aerosols, and then meteorological variables. And then the sites also have webcams. And all of these measurements are conducted automated, continuous, and year round at um, very high time resolutions, so minute to one hour time resolutions. Okay, so um, those two sites um, here with a double red um, circle, um, those are the two Longmont sites. And what I'd like to point out is that um, this is actually now part of a regional network. And what makes this, this really valuable and, and what adds um, high value is that we have these comparison opportunities since we're doing um, simultaneous monitoring now in uh, two sites in Broomfield, as well as the um, Boda Reservoir, it's in the up, upper left corner. And um, we've learned a lot about um, what's happening in Longmont by comparing these observations. Mm -hmm. So we are we're currently managing websites from these three different monitoring programs in Longmont, in Broomfield, and at Boulder County. And um, they're all um, shown here just with some screenshots. And what I'm listing here also are the visits and the site visits where we have counters, visit counters on these sites. And what I find remarkable is that actually right now Longmont has taken the first place and then we just generated this, this site, um, which is a data analysis tool. Um, and this is just a screenshot to give you an idea what you can do here. You can select in the left panel the sites that you want to um, investigate. And then on the right side, you can select the, the variable that you want to plot. Then you have a time window. Um, you can select the start date and the end date, and then just click go. And then it will generate graphs with um, these data um, all plotted together. You can see that ozone at all of these sites exceeded the standard. And you see how similar ozone behaves at these different sites. So ozone, it's a regional pollutant. It takes a while for it to build up. Air yeah, moves around during the time. So it's not like, you know, you have a certain neighborhood or a street corner where there's much more ozone than um, a block away. It's a regional pro pollutant and we, we all um, experience very similar levels here. However, on average, um, um, the highest level we've seen so far at the Boda Reservoir and at the um, Longmont Airport, you can see that here um, as well. That's where the, the ozone peaked on the, on the 21st. Okay, so ozone summary, what have you learned about ozone? So ozone is monitored at both um, the airport and the reservoir. So far this season, we had had four days with exceedance of the national ambient ozone air quality standard. Um, the exceedances at the airport have been slightly higher than at the, res at the um, Union Reservoir. And most times there's higher ozone in easterly winds than in westerly transport. Yeah. So in the region here where we are, it appears that you know, oil and gas is really the, the, the dominant sources, dominant source, contributing source for methane. At the bottom now you see the graph of the methane data and it shows methane for the reservoir, for the airport, also in Boulder. And then um, later this spring ozone came on light in Broomfield and that's the green data. So you can see it goes up and down, up and down, up and down, lots and lots of spikes. And you see a lot, a lot of purple and purple is um, the purple spike are higher than what the spikes we see at the airport and what we see at the, um, the reservoir. 
And um, if you go to the next slide, I think I have that blown up there. Yeah, yeah. So there you see um, now maybe some 20 days or so. And you see, you know, it's it's the bottom of the data is always the same even because there's a background in methane that's very uniform across the globe. But then on top of that background, you see these spikes and they're very short. You know, they're just a few minutes, um, half an hour or something. And you can see most of the spikes are in purple. So at the Union Reservoir, we see a far higher frequency and higher resulting concentrations in methane than at any of the other sites. So all these dots and there on the map, oil and gas wells, and you can see the Union Reservoir is the closest, um, the airport, possibly the second closest, and the Boda Reservoir is about the furthest away. And that nicely correlates with the um, distribution in the methane data we are seeing. Um, so the VOCs, we started monitoring at the reservoir in um, mid-February. So this, this graph here, it shows in blue the data from the um, Boda Reservoir that had been ongoing for two, three years. And then we turned our instruments on at the reservoir and said, wow, what's going on here? We were, we were really surprised. Um, because the levels we were seeing in February, March at the reservoir were, um, as you can tell here, significantly higher than what we'd ever seen at the Boda Reservoir before. And so the compound we're looking at here, ethane, is um, our favorite oil and gas tracer um, because there's really no other significant sources for ethane. So let's go to the next slide. Um, that again compares, you know, this, this, this whole window. And I've now added the very, very latest data. Um, and it actually makes you almost su suggest that maybe um, after a period of two, three months where it was quite moderate, um, the levels are picking up again, possibly. Um, so this shows the benzene from the Union Reservoir. And, you know, it looks similar to ethane. In February and March, there was a lot happening. There was a lot going on. Um, benzene spikes, many of them in the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 ppb range. And then come April, May, it slowed down a lot. And, you know, towards the later part now, um, it looks very similar to what we observe at the um, Boda Reservoir and in Broomfield. Um, so where is this basin coming from? Where's the benzene coming from? Where, where was it coming from um, in the earlier part of the record? So the four graphs here on the left, they show the benzene measurements. These are four hours of data. It shows actually three measurements we have. These were taken every two hours. These, these blue, the green dots. So first it was low, then it jumped up to that's the highest value, 8.5 or something. And then two hours later, it came down to two. And on the next graph to the right shows the methane plotted together with this, which we can measure at my high, much higher time resolution. And you can see the benzene peak coincided right when there was a spike in methane. So right together in the same. And then we did again what I showed earlier. We um, looked at the wind direction and the wind speed. And then the, the, the map on the right side shows where that spike roughly originated from in terms of wind direction. Um, you know, so this came from the, the northwestern sector. So the Union Reservoir serves two purposes. You know, as I showed in, in the map that had all the well locations, the Union Reservoir is on the upwind side of the city from where we expect the strongest influence from oil and gas industries, which are mostly located to the east, to the, to the east of the site. Um, so that was an, an, an early um, preference to have a site somewhere in that general area. And then the, the Western location, um, as you can see, it's on the other side of the city. And the, um, the argument here is that we wanna watch um, how air changes as it travels either east to west or west to east across the city footprint. And easterly and westerly winds are about the most, the two most prominent um, transport regimes we have here. Um, so this is largely driven by the motivation to monitor 
and watch over time the amount of emissions that's added to the air as the air travels to the city with the um, objective to watch the change in emissions and here in particular in greenhouse gas emissions from the city footprint. So this is driven, motivated by sustainability um, arguments. Um, the city has set itself the goal to drive greenhouse gas emissions down. So how do you <laughs> monitor if and how the city is moving towards this goal? So there's, this is actually really difficult to do. Um, but one of the things you can do is, is, is this, this map here, this, this, this cartoon, um, by watching how much is added as the um, air moves over the city. So we're doing exactly the same measurements in both locations using the same instruments, the same techniques, the same protocol for the primary greenhouse gases, which are CO2, which I didn't talk about at all really in the presentation, then methane and also ozone. So in between those three gases, we have about 75, 80% of the climate forcing um, of gases that are um, you know, contributed by, by human activities to, um, to global um, climate forcing. Um, so we're watching all those. Um, and, you know, if, if the, the city achieves its sustainability goal and cuts all this um, greenhouse gas emissions down to zero, then we should see, you know, the same behavior and very, very similar, similar levels um, in air as it travels across the city. And these are the two reference points that, that would be used for, for that comparison. And we already have, I didn't show it, but we've, we've, we've pulled data and compared um, data from the two sides. And we nicely see um, you know, how, how levels change as, as the air gets transported over the city footprint. Thank All right. <coughs> I thought the information was really good, Dr. Dub or Dr. Helmick, thank you. Um, any other final questions or comments? All right, Do Dr. Helmick, um, as always, your information and knowledge is more than welcome here in Longmont, and we look forward to future updates, reports, and work from you. Yeah. Thanks, you. Let me to share this with you tonight. All right, great. Thank you, sir. We're back. I move to adjourn. Oh, I'll second that. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Motion carries unanimously. See you next time. See you tomorrow, Harold. See you.